Before Sir Patrick provides an update on the latest data from our COBRA cor coronavirus dashboard, I just want to give you an update on the steps that we as a government have been taken to defeat coronavirus. Our step-by-step -step action plan is aiming to slow the spread of the virus, so fewer people need hospital treatment at any one time, thereby protecting the NHS's capacity. At each point, we've been following the scientific and medical advice, and we've been very deliberate in our actions, taking the right steps at the right moment. We're also taking unprecedented action to increase NHS capacity by dramatically expanding the numbers of beds, key staff, life-saving equipment on the front line, so that we give people the care they need when they need it most. That's why we're instructing people to stay at home so we can protect our NHS and save lives. I can report that through the government's ongoing monitoring and testing programme, as of today, 134,946 people have now been tested for the virus, 112,805 have tested negative, 22,141 have tested positive. Of those who have contracted the virus, 1,408 have, very sadly, died. We express our deepest condolences to the families and friends of those, of those who have passed away. And I think those figures are a powerful reminder to us all of the importance of following the government's guidelines. We must stay at home to protect our NHS and save lives. And I'd like to thank all of those involved on the front line, in particular all of those in the NHS, uh, for their battle against this virus. The amazing doctors, the amazing nurses, all the support staff working day and night. The thousands of other key workers, from our teachers to supermarket workers, to our fantastic diplomatic network, who are all, as a team, working around the clock to get us through this unprecedented coronavirus challenge. This is a united national effort and the spirit of selflessness shown by so many is an inspiration. I now want to turn to what we've been doing to support British people travelling around the world. Coronavirus hasn't just challenged us at home, it is the greatest global challenge in a generation. And as the countries work to secure their borders and stop the further spread of this deadly virus, we appreciate that an unprecedented number of UK travellers are trying to get home. And we're not talking a few hundred, or even a few thousands, we're talking about hundreds of thousands of people travelling around the world. So with that in mind, on the 17th of March, we advise people against all non-essential travel around the world. And since the 23rd of March, we've advised that all, all UK residents who are currently travelling abroad should return home. Hundreds of thousands have already done so. But many travellers haven't yet managed to get back home from young backpackers to retired couples on cruises. And we appreciate the difficult predicament that they find themselves in. We also recognise the anxiety of families here in the UK who are concerned to get their loved ones home. It's a worrying time for all of those who've been affected. And I want to assure them that this government, their government, is working around the clock to support, advise, and to help British travellers get home. I've spoken to more than 20 foreign ministers around the world in uh, the last week or so to support this effort to keep airports and ports open and to facilitate access to them by British travellers. Over the weekend, I spoke to foreign ministers from Australia, New Zealand, India and Brazil and Pakistan. And I also spoke to the Ethiopian Prime Minister and in all of those cases urged them to work with us to, com to keep commercial routes flying. Given the scale and the complexity of this challenge, it inevitably requires a team effort. So the Foreign Office is working with other governments. There's a particular focus on transit hubs. And we're also working with the airlines to keep as many flights running as possible. We've got a lot more to do, but we've already helped hundreds of thousands of Britons get home. The first priority has been to keep as many commercial flights running as we can. And that's based on just purely the, the scale and the number of people who want to come home. And as a result of those efforts and the cooperation we received from the Spanish government, we've enabled an estimated 150,000 UK nationals to get back from Spain. 
on other commercial routes that have come under pressure. We've worked with partner governments and airlines to get back 8,500 UK travellers from Morocco, around 5,000 UK nationals from Cyprus. That gives you a sense of the scale of the challenge and the numbers of British travellers abroad. Now, in circumstances where commercial flights can't operate, we've already chartered flights which proved necessary to return 1,400 UK nationals on flights, for example, from, uh, from China at the outset of this crisis and more recently from Peru. We've not faced challenges like this in getting people home from abroad on this scale in recent memory. Airports are closing down or preventing airlines from operating on a commercial basis. Local authorities have placed restrictions on movement that prevent people from getting to the airport. And the critical transit hubs that we rely on for long-haul flights are also shutting down or in some cases limiting their flights. Some of these restrictions have been done uh, with very little notice, some with no notice at all, which makes it very difficult to respond. So international collaboration is absolutely vital. As I said, it's a team effort and it involves government working with other governments, but also working with the airlines. So with that in mind, I can today announce a new arrangement between the government and airlines to fly home tens of thousands of stranded British travellers where commercial flights are no longer possible. Partner airlines include British Airways, Virgin, EasyJet, Jet2 and Titan, and this list can be expanded. Under the arrangements that we are putting in place, we will target flights from a range of priority countries starting this week. And let me explain a little bit about how this will work in practice. Where commercial routes remain an option, airlines will be responsible for getting passengers home. That means offering alternative flights at little to no cost where routes have been cancelled. And it means allowing passengers to change tickets, including between carriers. So for those still in those countries where commercial options are still available, don't wait. Don't run the risk of getting stranded. The airlines are standing by to help you. Please book your tickets as soon as possible. Where commercial flights are no longer running, the government will provide the necessary financial support for special charter flights to bring UK nationals back home. Once special charter flights have been arranged, we will promote them through the government's travel advice and by the British Embassy or High Commission in the relevant country. British travellers who want a seat on those flights will book and pay directly through a dedicated travel management company. We've designated £75 million to support those flights and the airlines in order to keep the cost down and affordable for those seeking to return to the UK. And in arranging these flights, our priority will be the most vulnerable, including the elderly, or those with particularly pressing medical needs, and also looking in particular at countries where we've got large numbers of UK tourists struggling to get home. UK travellers, if they haven't already done so, should check the Foreign Office travel advice, and that advice is under constant review, and it can help travellers find out more details about how to access the flights under this arrangement. They should also follow the social media of the UK Embassy or High Commission in the country where they find themselves, so that they can be directed to accurate, real-time information from the local authorities. For any questions that can't be advised, uh, answered in that travel advice, or by the UK embassies or uh, High Commission, we also have our call centre working 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Now, I know it's been difficult to get through for some travellers. Just to give you a sense of the sheer volume, on average, we normally receive 1,000 calls a day to that call centre. Last Tuesday, we had nearly 15,000, the highest on record. So we've boosted our resources, we've redeployed people to assist in the call centre, and we've tripled our capacity. Yesterday, the call centre answered 99% of calls and helped thousands of British travellers to get the answers that they need. So for those stranded or for families nervously waiting news and uh, wanting to see their loved ones return home, we're doing everything we can. We've improved our advice and boosted the call centre so travellers get better and swifter information. We've put in place this arrangement with the airlines so that we can reach more British citizens in vulnerable circumstances abroad where commercial flights aren't running. And we're working intensively around the clock 
with all of our partner countries and governments around the world to keep open the airports, the ports and the flights to bring people home. We've not faced an international challenge quite like this before, but together we're going to rise to it. And of course here at home, we can all support our NHS by continuing to follow the guidance to stay at home, protect our NHS and save lives. And I think I'll now hand over to Patrick Valance uh, who will give a presentation on the latest data and then we'll take some questions after that. So thank Patrick, thank you very much. Um, I wanted to share with you some of the information about where we are in this outbreak and some of the measures that have been taken. And the idea, as we've said repeatedly, is to try and break and slow transmission of the virus, and that's through staying at home and keeping distant. So the first slide shows that actually this has been successful in terms of the behaviour changes, and I want to thank everybody for the way in which everyone is adhering to the measures that have been put in place. This shows the use of transport over time from the end of February through to now, and you can see a dramatic fall off in the use of the London Tube, down to just a few percent of what it was back in the end of February, a decrease in bus use, a decrease in national rail, and a decrease also in the use of all motor vehicles. So the measures are in place, they are making a difference, they are decreasing the contact, which is so important to spread the disease, and we're doing a good job at cutting that down. Now, the reason that's important is because, of course, it then prevents the number of cases, should reduce the number of cases. Next slide, please. So this shows the number of new UK cases, and I'll repeat what I've said before. This is cases that are detected with a positive test, so it's an underestimate of the total number of cases, and it's those cases which have been tested because they've come to hospital. What you can see is there's been an increase in the number of cases since the middle of March through to today, we expect that the measures that are in place that have caused that social distancing, the stay-at-home message, will be reducing the number of cases of transmission in the community and decreasing the number of cases overall. As the cases flatten off, and we shouldn't take too much attention to individual day-to-day -day variation, we need to look over time and see what's happening, we would expect this, in turn, to decrease the number of people needing admission to hospital. Next slide, please. This graph shows the total number of people admitted to hospital since the middle of March, which is now 8,000 people with coronavirus. That's gone up pretty much the same amount each day for the last uh, few days. That shows that it's going up not in an increasing amount, but going up in a constant amount, which may suggest that we're already beginning to see some effects through. About half of those cases, slightly under half, are in London. But what you can see in the lower lines on this graph is that we're also seeing cases throughout the UK. So the message, stay at home, protect the NHS, and save lives, is true everywhere in the UK. We all need to do this in order to break and slow the transmission of this virus, decrease the number of cases, and in turn, decrease the number of people coming into hospital. What I've said recently is that we expect this to get worse over the next couple of weeks because there's a lag phase between getting the disease and people turning up in hospital. So we would expect to see a continuation of this at least over two or three weeks, then a stabilisation and a gradual decrease thereafter. The number of hospital admissions, to repeat, has gone up roughly the same amount each day suggesting that we're not on a fast acceleration at the moment. Next slide, please. All of this is about preventing deaths and preventing the NHS becoming overwhelmed in the intensive care units with ventilators. And on this graph, it tracks the deaths that have occurred globally across some, some of the countries, not all of the countries, obviously. And it shows that there is a pattern of increasing deaths which you expect to plateau, reach a plateau to come down eventually. And you can see in the UK here, which is in the purple line, we're tracking roughly along the same path as France. I've said before, we're behind Italy in terms of the curve. You can see that Spain has a higher number than Italy at the moment in terms of its trajectory, not in terms of the total number, but the direction in which it's going. The UK is tracking 
Alongside France in this, the measures we're taking will stop the transmission, delay the transmission, reduce the number of cases, re reduce the number of people becoming infected in the community, reduce the number of people, therefore, that need to go onto ventilators, and therefore reduce the number of people also that might die or will die from this infection. So I want to thank all of the people in the NHS who are working unbelievably hard at the front line to look after this. What we can do, what all of us can do, is make sure that we heed the advice to stay at home, to reduce those contacts so that we ultimately decrease the number of people who are going to be seriously ill or die from this infection. Thank you very much, Patrick. And uh, I think we'll turn to questions now. Is Laura Kunzberg there? Um, thank you, Foreign Secretary. First off, Sir Patrick, based on what you know now, are the restrictions working? And could we avoid the NHS being overwhelmed if the trajectory continues like this? And Foreign Secretary, you're asking a huge amount of the public. Is it the government's view that people need to be willing to follow these restrictions for as long as six months, if that's what it takes? Shall I start? Why don't you um, the trajectory, what, what, what we know is that the um, measures that have been taken are having a very big effect on contacts. And I showed you the data on transport. You can see dramatic reductions in the amount of transport being used. You see dramatic reductions in footfall. We know, of course, that things like restaurants and pubs, which are places where people aggregate, have been, uh, have been closed. So we are seeing a big change in contacts. That is predicted to have a very significant effect on the so-called R, the R value is the number of people on average infected by one infected person. And the idea is to get that number below one, at which point the epidemic stops and starts to go down. On the basis of the contacts, you would expect that R value now, in terms of the early phases of transmission in the community, to be coming down or below one, so that we think that that has had the effect that's, that's desired. That takes two or three weeks to, f to feed through into the number of people who might be appearing in hospital, a little longer in terms of those who are seriously ill or those, of course, that might die. So we expect to see a lag phase before you really see these curves changing. I'll also make a comment about the duration. It's important that we do this now to get the numbers below NHS ICU capacity. That is the absolute priority at the moment. Once that is achieved, once we know that we've got this curve below the ICU capacity and stable, then, of course, it's time to start asking the question which is being asked across the world at the moment. How do we release those measures and manage this going forward? So I think it's premature to put a time, an absolute time, on how long, long this goes on for. We need to do phase one, and then we need to think about how we release these in the right way and at the right approach in order to be able to allow the curve to stay below the ICU capacity. And I think the only thing, Laura, that I'd add is that obviously uh, the more uh, members of the public, as they're doing increasingly, uh, follow this guidance, the uh, quicker we'll be able to get into a position where we review whether and how there is any easing of those restrictions. Beth Rigby, Beth Rigby from Sky. Thank you. Uh, a question first for Sir Patrick. On, on Friday, the NHS chief said there were 6,200 coronavirus patients in hospital. Today, he said it was 9,000. That's nearly 1,000 new patients a day. Do you think those numbers will accelerate over the next two to three weeks? And at what stage at the moment do you think the NHS could hit capacity? And then just a quick question uh, for the Foreign Secretary, please. Germany's testing 70,000 people a day. Countries like South Korea are doing mass testing and contact tracing uh, to try and control the spread of coronavirus. Our target is 25,000 tests a day. Is that because you think that number is optimal or rather is it that we can't get our hands on the equipment because other countries have been faster out of the blocks? Hmm. Shall I answer the question about um, the numbers? So 6,000 to 9,000, roughly 1,000 a, um, a day going up in, in, that, in that measure. Um, that's not an acceleration. It's quite important. And, and it tells you that actually this is a bit more stable than it has been. I do expect that number to continue. I expect the number of people 
coming every day to be about that. It may go up a little bit. Um, and uh, then in two or three weeks, you would expect that to stabilize and then to start to go down a bit. But it's important that's not a rapidly acceleration number. It's an important number. It's a very difficult number to deal with. And it's a number that the NHS staff are clearly coping with in terms of uh, what they're doing at the moment. And the numbers as projected are designed, as uh, the Chief Medical Officer has said, to keep this below the ICU capacity. You can't promise, and I certainly wouldn't promise, that every single ICU is never going to breach its number because that happens every winter. But the aim is to try and keep that below across the country, and that's what we're shooting for. That's what um, the numbers suggest we should achieve there or thereabouts, and that's what we need to keep striving for. And it's why it's so important that we continue to stop the transmission in the community because that keeps the numbers down going into that critical stage. Beth, all I'd add is that. Um we're operating on multiple fronts to increase the testing. That includes purchasing more tests. It also means the progress we've been making bringing former NHS staff back into the workforce. Or we want to scale that up as swiftly as possible, but it's got to be uh, reliable. I, I think it was the chief medical officer that said one thing worse than no test is a bad test. So we've got to do this in a safe way. Um, as of this morning, over 900 NHS frontline staff have been tested as part of our new testing scheme, and we'll be rapidly expanding that. Andy Bell from Channel 5. Thank you. Um, question for the Foreign Secretary. First of all, do you worry that in some parts of the country, uh, police forces are interpreting uh, the instructions from government, shall we say, overzealously and maybe encroaching a little bit too much on the way people maybe want to exercise, take their one piece of exercise a day, for instance? Um, question for Dr Doyle. Um, as a health service professional, are you concerned that we're still seeing lots of examples on social media of people in the front line of the NHS who feel that they simply don't have the correct PPE that they should have? You must be worried about that. And a final question for Sir Patrick. Are you thinking about adding the symptoms of loss of taste and smell as symptoms that uh, might be appointed towards uh, people having the virus? Do you want to go first? Thank you. So on the uh, protective equipment, um, there has been a huge amount of uh, material delivered to uh, the hospitals and uh, clinics on the front line, 170 million items. And over this weekend is certainly an acknowledgement that people need more of this. Um, so, uh, tens of millions of the uh, equivalent, uh, the right equipment has been delivered as well and will continue to be. And uh, getting supplies to the front line is absolutely critical uh, to ensure that people feel safe. It comes alongside a, a refresh of the guidance to ensure that people are clear what equipment should be used in what circumstances. And that is very active at the moment. And just on the question you asked me about uh, police forces, look, I, I've got huge admiration for the uh, incredible job all of our emergency services are doing, including the police. Obviously, we need some common sense in the way some of uh, the, the, the way that that is um, uh, approached. On the other hand, let's also bear in mind the number one thing, the number one message which the police are rightly trying to convey, in my view, is that people need to follow the guidance, not just to the letter, but also to the spirit. That is the way we tackle this challenge and get through it quicker and as quickly as possible. So I fully support the police in what they're trying to achieve. Patrick. The uh, symptoms that the Chief Medical Officer has outlined as being the ones that um, uh, uh, um, uh, the ones that you self-isolate on are persistent new cough and uh, f or fever or fever. Um, loss of taste and smell is something that can happen with um, other respiratory viruses as well. It does seem to be a feature of this from what people are reporting um, and it is something that obviously people should take into account as they think about their symptoms. I think it's really for the, the chief medical officers to decide at what point, if any, the diagnostic uh, change takes place in terms of self-isolation. And those symptoms that we're learning about for this disease are the ones that you know c uh, we're going to um, get more information on over time, but new persistent cough or fever captures the vast majority of people with this, uh, with this illness. Gordon Rayner from the Daily Telegraph, please. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Uh, just, just to pick up on Andy's question, um, Lord Sumption, the former Supreme Court Justice, suggested today that some areas of the country are turning into a police state. 
So will the government issue further guidance on what the police should or shouldn't find people for so that ordinary members of the public don't get criminalised for shopping for the wrong thing or taking a breather on, on a park bench? Um, can I also ask you, as it's your, your first uh, press conference uh, since uh, the China issue has come up, do you, do you believe, like some of your colleagues apparently do, that China should or will face a reckoning uh, when all this is over? Um, and just lastly, a question for... Uh, Sir Patrick. Um, can I ask you, Sir Patrick, how reliable are the official figures on the number of deaths from coronavirus that we're seeing? Downing Street's admitted today that there is a lag in the figures. Um, we're told that uh, some of the figures that are coming out are, are up to two weeks old in some cases. Uh, and the ONS is going to be um, putting out figures tomorrow on how many people have died who aren't in hospital. So have we only been given part of the truth so far? So uh, just as I said already on the police, of course we back the police doing a very difficult job in unprecedented circumstances. Surely, uh, of course, there needs to be common sense in the way some of that guidance is interpreted. But overall, the overriding message that we want to convey to the British public, and I think the police are rightly trying to convey, is that we need to all be following the letter and the spirit of that guidance, and that's the way we curtail this virus and we get through this challenge as quickly as possible. On China, look, the, at home here, in terms of tackling this coronavirus uh, crisis uh, and challenge, we need to come together as a team. Internationally, we need to bring as many countries together if we're going to collaborate effectively in tackling this crisis and stopping further waves. Uh, we had good cooperation with the Chinese government in terms of uh, repatriating UK nationals from Wuhan, but obviously after the crisis has abated, I think the time will be right to conduct a kind of lessons learnt and uh, I'm sure the World Health Organization will be at the forefront of that. In answer to the question about deaths, yes, there's a lag in the data. Um, there's a lag in the data. I think the CMO has expressed this before in terms of verifying exactly um, the time and the cause of death and, and making sure that all of that side of things is accurate because you get presumed and then you get confirmed in terms of the virus. So, yes, there's a lag in the data um, and there'll always be some lag. And I think the uh, NHS and public health England are working very hard to sort of close that gap and make sure that the lag is as short as possible. And ONS, I've uh, been speaking to the national statistician and the ONS data will pick up also those people who didn't die in hospital but may have died from coronavirus in the community. So that will lead to um, some extra numbers on top of that. Don't expect those to be large, and it's important going forward that we have this reconciliation between all of the numbers. Ben Glaze from the Daily Mirror. Thank you, Foreign Secretary. Um, the Daily Mirror is campaigning to give a medal to our brave NHS workers and staff on the front line fighting this virus. Um, will you uh, back that campaign today? I think the job they're doing is amazing, inspirational. We've all talked about it uh, from these podiums. And uh, of course, they deserve uh, all the tributes and all the recognition. And I'm sure we want to look very carefully about how we do that uh, once we've got the other side of this crisis. Liz Piper from Reuters. Hi there. Um, I just wanted to ask a very specific question on antibody testing. When will these tests actually be rolled out and what will the testing regime look like? Will be able, people be able to take them at home? Will there be special stations set up where people can do this and how widely available will they be? And Foreign Secretary, one more question if I may. Um, since the Prime Minister and Health Secretary have tested positive for coronavirus, can I inquire about your health? How are you feeling? I'm feeling terrific, thank you very much. Um, and uh, the Prime Minister chaired the 9.15 meeting and was full of vigour and giving us the leadership we need. And we're a united uh, cabinet team in, ter in terms of getting the country through this crisis. Um, I will, on your technical question on the testing, defer to Yvonne Dole. Thank you, Secretary of State. So testing is a crucial part of our uh, strategy to um, deal with this epidemic. And there are a number of strands. And we've heard one mentioned already here, which is the 25,000 uh, tests per day that Public Health England and the NHS are well on the way to meeting by the mid to late April. Now, there are a number of others, and you've mentioned one, which is the antibody testing. 
This at the moment is under investigation. Uh, it is a test that is novel. Uh, it would be a point of care testing, so it would be done in the place. Per, uh, it could be done, for instance, in the home. And it could be done at scale. But um, I would come back to the statement that the Chief Medical Officer made, which is this one thing worse than a no test is a bad test. And this testing needs to be evaluated to make sure it's valid. In other words, it does what it says. And that you know, at scale, and this would be large numbers, we want to make sure that we're doing something that's safe and that is actually valid, that it, it is correct when it is read. Thank you all very much.